Second Chances of the Soul by 55 Artists. Chapter 14, Unexpected Dangers. Cleveland, Ohio. After discovering the possible location of the Red Book in New Jurisdiction afternoon, Tony and Natasha decided to fly the Quinjet to Cleveland, Idaho, mostly because Natasha complained that travelling long distances whilst being carried in an Iron Man suit was unbearably uncomfortable. In all, Tony, in all honesty, Tony would have been much happier travelling in his suit, as it was far more efficient and enjoyable, for him anyway. Tony had insisted on waiting until today to confront Karpov, though, as Peter had been having a hard time after running into Skip out the restaurant on his birthday. He wanted to make sure he was right by Peter's side, at least until he was feeling a lot better. Since May was busy with work, he had spent the day after Peter's birthday with him, watching movies, working on lab with Iron Man and Spider-Man stuff, and even helping Pete finish one of his Star Wars Lego sets. Looks like we're here, Tony informed Natasha as the self-piloting Quinjet in stealth mode to avoid drawing attention, began to land in front of Karpov's residence. His host looked rather quaint from the outside, but it seemed as though Karpov didn't really put much effort into maintaining it. The paint was peeling, the roof shingles appeared to be falling off, and there was a hole in the left side of the garage door. The two Avengers put on their baseball caps and sunglasses as disguises and then stepped out of the Quinjet. Hopefully the inside looks better than the outside, Tony remarked, wrinkling his nose. Remember the plan? Natasha double-checked. Please, aim Jen Romanoff, you know me. My only plan is to attack. Tony answered bluntly. Sheesh, Tony, no! We need to be discreet. We ring the bell so we don't send him, set him off right away. And we don't interrogate him until we get inside. The last thing we need is for Hydra to know that we're searching for the Red Book, or that we know anything about the Winter Soldier, Natasha exclaimed. We don't want a bunch of news reports about how Iron Man and Black Widow were spotted attacking some random guys out in Cleveland. Oh, fine, Tony relented. We'll do it the boring way. The two of them darted forward to the front door, and Natasha rang the bell. Food delivery! Natasha called out. I checked, he just ordered a Big Mac from McDonald's via Postmates, Natasha explained in a whisper. Tony curled his lips. Ugh, doesn't this diet no know Burger King is the only place with decent burgers? Leave it at the door, said a man with a Russian accent. I am not going to do a Russian accent. I can't do accents, really. I try, as you guys know, but I'm not accurate. Now what? What was the extent of your brilliant plan to, for this bit? Tony said sarcastically, shut up, Tony. Natasha responded before she raised her right leg and thrust it against the door, which promptly fell to the ground with a bang. For the record, this is what I had originally proposed that we do, Tony pointed out. Natasha ignored him as she walked right up to the man. Tony could only see him was Karpov with a gun drawn. Hand over the red book right now, Natasha barked. I do not know what you speak of, Karpov hissed, his gaze not quite meeting their eyes. Cut the bullshit, Tony interjected, removing his sunglasses and staring directly at Karpov. We know that you work with Hydra, and that you guys have been using code words in that book to brainwash the Winter Soldier into killing far too many people. Karpov's eyes widened for a brief moment before scowling once more. Tony Stark, he spat out. The one and only. Tony answered, if you weren't part of the organisation that killed my parents, I'd totally offer you an autograph since you're clearly a huge fan. If you want to live, hand over the book right now, Natasha demanded as she took a few more steps forward and pushed her pistol right against Karpov's forehead. Karpov said nothing but let out a menacing laugh, though he had a nervous look in his eyes. Tony felt a anger spurt through his veins. Karpov had actively been a part of an organisation that killed his parents, and he had the nerve to laugh as if the death of thousands of innocent people was amusing. Without a second thought, Tony raised his arm and shoot, shooting a repulsor blast right into the man's stomach. Karpov was instantly thrown back against the back wall of his kitchen and red blood decorated the tan wallpaper. Way to steal my thunder, Tony, Natasha muttered. He's the reason my parents died, Tony grunted, directing another glare towards the bleeding Russian man. Karpov coughed violently as he tried to stand out back up. None of what happened was my fault. Even without me, Hydra would go on. You cannot possibly blame me for the death of Howard Stark. The bastard and his bitch of a wife deserved what they got. 
car Bob spat out before falling to the ground once again. Abnation of responsibility is what causes chaos to persist. Tony hissed. Hail Hydra! Karpov declared. All right, I've had enough of this shit. Romanov, would you like to do the honours? Tony asked. By all means. By all means. Natasha answered stoically as she once again raised her pistol and fired once at Karpov's head. Natasha and Tony proceeded to rummage through the house in search of the Red Book. Karpov's lack of hygiene only exacerbated the difficulty to search. Piles and piles of dirty clothing, old fast food containers and loose papers littered the floor, and the ventilation system was clearly out of order, as a musty odour aggressively filled Tony's no nose, causing multiple coughing fits. Certain corners of the carpet had big black blotches that Tony at first assumed were ink stains, only to find out that they were ants. Finally, after spending an hour in the hellhole that was Karpov's dwelling, Tony finally unearthed the red book from underneath a pile of food wrappers and sweaty clothing. Now they just had to find one super soldier assassin so covert that people believed him to only be a legend. How hard could that be? Line break. Oh my gosh, I can't believe I'm going to be on the red carpet! This is so cool! Peter squealed as Tony fixed his tie as they rode in the limousine. It was the night of the annual Stark charity gala supporting neuroscience research. While Tony was fairly certain he'd skipped the gala the first time around, Peppa had insisted that he show up since she herself was at home taking care of Harley, who had contracted the chickenpox. Tony had dragged a very enthusiastic Peter along with him to keep him sane while he made small talk with the pretentious rich elite. Remember, kid, if a reporter tries to shove a camera or microphone in your face, and proceeds to ask you an intrusive question like the vultures they usually are, you walk away. And if they chase after you, I want you to come to me, and I will take care of it immediately, Tony instructed. Got it? Yeah, duh. I mean, Tony? Peter replied, this is going to be the best night ever. When Happy pulled up to the entrance, Tony handed Peter a, a pair of custom-designed, very fashionable ones, if he said so himself sunglasses that he had made the night before. Hey, Pete, I know that the flashing lights from the cameras mess with your spidey senses, so make sure you wear these when we go in. Peter eagerly took the glasses, gushing about how awesome they were. I look just like you always do when you wear sunglasses inside, Tony. You brought the earplugs, right, bud? Tony double-checked. Nodding enthusiastically, Peter said, yes, and I'll wear them if it gets too loud in there. Tony wrapped his arm around Peter as they walked onto the red carpet, and the two of them indulged the paparazzi with a series of both serious and silly poses. The two of them giggled as they threw up peace signs and placed bunny ear hand symbols at the top of each other's heads. Eventually, after making it through the carpeted entrance, Tony found himself nodding off as the likes of Elon Musk, politicians, and other high society types made their typical pretentious small talk that usually transpired at Garner's. While Peter had initially been over the brim with excitement upon being introduced to such well-known figures, even his exuberance waned on as the conversations dragged. A young boy's voice broke through Mark Zuckerberg's monotone voice. Seriously, Tony sometimes wondered if the theories of him being a lizard actually had some merit. The guy's mannerisms were just unnatural. As he described Facebook's future endeavours, Yo, Peter, my man! Tony and Peter turned around to see the faces of both Norman and Harry Osborne. Groaning internally, Tony forced himself to acknowledge Norman with a curt nod, fighting back a scathing comment about his horrid outfit choice. Peppa had voiced her concerns that Peter and Harley had been picking up too many of Tony's ruder tendencies. Hey, Harry! Tony greeted. Hi, Harry! Peter greeted, clearly happy to find someone of his own age under the age of 30 in the vicinity. Harry grabbed Peter's ha by the arm. Come on! Let's go and hang out somewhere else! If you stay here, you'll literally die of boredom. Peter looked to Tony with hopeful eyes. Can I go and play with Harley? Tony hesitated for a few seconds. After all, he remembered all the shenanigans he had gotten into with other children of famous people during the galas in his youth. The last thing he needed was for Peter to get peer pressured into doing something he wasn't comfortable with, or getting involved with something inappropriate. I guess it should be fine. I mean, they're not even teenagers yet. I doubt they're going into anything overly concerning. When Tony didn't respond immediately, Peter spoke up again. I'll be fine, he reassured Tony. I have my watch with me, and I'll let you know if I need anything. Okay, fine. 
Tony relented. Meet me back at the entrance by 10 o'clock. And if anything feels even remotely wrong, I mean anything, call me over. Okay, kid? Peter thanked Tony and profusely promised that he would be fine without supervision for a brief period of time. Tony knew that he was probably overreacting. After all, it was a small event. And nothing dangerous had ever happened the last time the place had been... T the last time it, the event had taken place. Still, he could not quite completely quell his paranoia. It seemed to be expected since he'd literally seen his child vanish in the snap of a finger. Line break. Harry led Peter into a private quarter towards the back of the building. The two of them appeared to be the youngest among those in the room, as most of the guests seemed to be in their early to late teens. Peter coughed at the eccentrically smoked boy close to his age, blew a puff of smoke his way. It smells like a skunk just farted in here, Peter said as he wrinkled his nose. Oh, wow, you really are innocent, Harry giggled. Peter frowned at his comment. What do you mean, Harry? It's not a skunk, Pete. It's weed, Harry explained, looking amused. Oh, I am going to have so much fun corrupting your innocent little mind. Of course, uh, duh, I totally knew that, Peter answered sheepishly. Peter followed Harry to the back of the room and watched it with fascination as Harry tapped a couple of beer bottles against the edge of the table, subsequently popping off the crown corks and producing a light sizzling noise as the gold liquid bubbled over the top. Survival tip number one for these events is to never go through them while sober, Harry declared as he took a swig of beer and pushed one towards Peter. Uh, um, I don't think I should drink. Peter said nervously, my dear, I mean, Tony will kill me if he finds out. Wouldn't it be hypocritical for him to lecture you about drinking? I mean, the guy spent the 90s with pictures of his drunk butt plastered all over the tabloids of covers everywhere. Harry pointed out, Tony told me that he's been completely sober for a few years now. He says he regrets the way he behaved back when he was drinking, and that it's easy to become dependent on it. That's why he wants me to be careful with alcohol, Peter explained. Harry shrugged as he grabbed the beer he'd just given to Peter and chugged it. So yourself, just know that the rest of the night is going to be unbearable without a little liquid courage. Wow, Osborne. I see you're still childish over dramatic borderline alcoholic. A girl with long black hair around Peter's age cut in. She wore a black pantsuit that looked like it was worth more money than Peter's old apartment back in Queens. Her bright blue eyes radiated warmth despite her blunt demeanour. Rolling his eyes, Harry said with a teasing tone, And I see that you still insist on dressing like a cocktail waitress, Bishop. Shall I place my drink order with you? That's hilarious, she deadpanned, playfully scoffing at Harry. The girl then turned towards Peter, the light accentuating her shiny, perfectly curled dark hair as she whipped her luscious locks behind her. I'm Kate, by the way. Kate Bishop. She offered her hand to Peter. I'm Peter. Peter Parker. Peter replied as he shyly accepted her handshake. Parker, huh? Well, please don't tell me you're the bastard son of the socialite Pearl Parker I've heard rumours about for years. Kate shivered as if she was recounting an unpleasant memory. Peter opened his mouth to say no, but Kate rambled on before he could get a word in. It looked like Peter had finally found someone equally prone to going off on tangents while speaking as him. I mean, if you are, it's totally fine. I don't judge people based on their families, unlike the rest of the kids here. For crying out loud, my mum is dating this creepy guy from the Dunsk family, and I have a bad feeling they're going to get married someday. That would make me related to a guy with this weird sword obsession who looks like a second-rate macabre version of my father. Man, I miss my dad. He died last year when my penthouse got robbed. It was an armed robbery. It's part of the reason why my mum found Bishop's sanctuary. She said nothing like that would ever happen again with our new security systems. Personally, I'm not a fan of the idea of... Bishop, I'm going to stop you right there before you spill your entire life story and traumatise Peter with your never-ending pile of dirty laundry. Harry chimed in. Kate blushed and lightly punched Harry. Sorry, brevity isn't exactly my strong suit. Don't worry. If Peter was actually related to Pearl Parker, I would not be caught near him. Harry turned back towards Peter. No offence to you personally, Pete, but that woman is absolutely dreadful to be around. As much as I like you, just isn't worth the risk of having a second encounter with that wretch. Peter just smiled and shrugged as he had absolutely no idea of who the Pearl character in question was. Oh, thank God! Kate said dramatically. So, what the hell brings you to this shit show anyway? 
my d I mean Tony brought he me here because Peter my d I mean Tony brought me here because Peppa really wanted him to come but he didn't want to come alone I mean that's at least what he told me I'm not sure why he wanted me to keep him company I'm not that interesting after all my brother Harley was supposed to come Peter began wait Tony and Peppa as in Tony Stark and Peppa Podstock? Kate excitedly asked as her eyes widened in recognition. You're one of the kids that Iron Man basically adopted. I saw you in the interview with Tony Stark, Captain America and the Black Widow you did on Jimmy Fallon's last night talk show. Oh my god, do you know Hawkeye? He's literally my favourite Avenger because he, I'm kind of a big shot archer myself. Harry rolled his eyes. Yes, yes, yes. We all know about your embarrassing celebrity crush on Clint Barton, even though he's like 40 years old. I do not have a crush on him, Kate exclaimed as her cheeks flushed red. As an aspiring professional archer myself, I just admire the incredible abilities as an expert marksman. She insisted. Right. You're an aspiring professional archer. Harry scoffed. Sarcasm dripping from the tone of his voice. What are you going to do when that profession takes on the mantle of Hawkeye after Clint Barton retires? I never know. It could happen. Kate mumbled. Peter spent the next half hour indulging Kate's questions about the Avengers, most of them involving inquiries about the nature of Hawkeye's trick arrows, which Peter did not know exactly much about. Throughout the conversation, Harry continued offering the two preteens drinks that Peter and Kate denied. When Peter came back to the party after excusing himself to take a restroom break, his stomach made a loud rumbling noise. Clearly, his enhanced metabolism was not happy he had forgotten to eat dinner before the gala. Unfortunately for Peter, there wasn't any food in the room with actual substance. The only consumable item that Peter could find was a tray of brownies. Upon biting a brownie, Peter noticed an extremely subtle, odd flavour. Because he was absolutely ravenous, he ignored the weird taste and polished off the entirety of the tray. Oh boy. Okay, I think I know what just happened. Yeesh. After a grueling two hours of engaging in mundane dialogues with ostentatious ass-kissers who prattled on and on, Without ever actually saying anything remotely insightful, Tony wanted nothing more than to grab Peter and leave. He had already made a sizable donation to the neurosurgery department of Mount Sinai Hospital, so there was really no point in sticking around. In the past, drowning himself in hard liquor had actually made these events somewhat enjoyable, but Tony wasn't about to subject himself to another bout of alcohol abuse after years of sobriety. Right as he was about to head out and look for Peter, Tony caught the sight of a familiar face. One that he had not seen since the final battle against Thanos. The bleaker street magician. Well, since it was likely prior to his Hogwarts years of training, Tony supposed it was more accurate name would be Dr. Stephen Strange. Upon realising he had locked eyes with the neurosurgeon a few moments too long, Tony quickly lowered his gaze. The last thing he needed was to make a conversation with the man. He may have played a substantial part in the defeat of the Mad Titan, but the guy was still a kitschy asshole. Dr. Stark, the doctor greeted with a curt nod. Are you def or do you prefer the name Iron Man? Personally, I think the moniker is rather tacky. You should get some help in the naming department. Shit. It looked like Tony had a inadvertently caught Gandalf's attention. Tony scoffed. Says the guy whose name is literally the word strange. Bet you all heard some name puns when you were growing up, he retorted. Surprisingly, strange did not seem to take offence. Instead, his lips curled in what appeared to be mistaken for a slight smile. Tony laughed inwardly at the absurdity of the situation. The ass-hat wizard doctor was actually smiling as a result of something Tony had said. Touché, Steve replied before his eyebrows curled in confusion. How do you know who I am? Contrary to what many people assume, I actually do do my own research before attending any kind of charity event. Your name was rather difficult to miss. Not just because it's a strange one, but also because you have received a plethora of accolades in the field of neuro neurology. Tony lied smoothly. Great, now I sound like an ass kisser, and I don't even like this guy. Stephen Strange's face broke into a full smile, his annoyingly shiny teeth showing and all. Clearly the guy who enjoying re enjoyed receiving recognition. What a narcissist. You are not at all what I expected you to be like, Strange commented. Tony shrugged. I like to keep people on their toes, Doc. I'd be hurt if you called me predictable. It's synonymous with boring. Speaking of which, have you ever considered spicing up your look? Your current one is very fitting. 
too fitting for clean cut goody two shoes doctor like yourself. It makes you predictable, aka boring. Have you ever considered growing out facial hair? I'd suggest a goatee. And instead of a silk Tom Ford suit, you could go for a sentient red cape. Rolling his eyes, Strange added, Though your personality was on par with how irritating I expected it to be. Thanks. I try my best, Tony responded sarcastically. Besides, there's no such thing as a sentient cape. Strange pointed out, unless there is another definition of the word sentient that I am unaware of. Wow. You are seriously unimaginative, Doc. How are you ever going to master your abracadabra shit with an attitude like that? Tony quipped. Stephen Strange looked at Tony for a good five seconds before shaking his head, his facial expression clearly communicating that he thought Tony was not sound of mind. You know, my girlfriend, Christine, she always insists that you're a hero, despite some of the negative PR from the media circus. Strange began, yeah, no shit, Sherlock, that's kind of what I do. I literally fought off an alien invasion, Tony pointed out. Strange that had a frustrated sigh. The wizard looked like he very much regretted ever initiating conversation with Tony. Anyway, as I was saying before your big mouth rudely cut me off, I can already tell that I am going to regret admitting this. But while I'm used to believe that you donned the Iron Man armour for notoriety purposes, after seeing what you did during the alien invasion and how you handled the Mandarin, I have come to realise that you actually are a... hero. He finished, the last word sounding like it tasted sour coming off his tongue. In a rare moment of earnestness, Tony replied, You are too, dog. While Tony was referring to the doctor's escapades as a wizard against mystical threats, Strange likely interpreted the meaning of his words in relation to the lives he had undoubtedly saved performing neurology. On neurosurgery. Line break. Along, upon learning of the extravagant gala, event from the poorly misguardian child, Harley, who had been incessantly complaining about not being able to walk the red carpet with Stark due to the fact his illness had confined him to the tower, Loki decided to crash the party, as the Midgardians would say. After all, the event seemed to be right up his alley. A spotlight, free alcohol, and people who adored him for his hero status. To the point where they might just keel over before him. And if his unexpected presence ended up annoying Stark, that would just be an added bonus for Loki. Loki smiled widely for the photographers upon his arrival on the famous red carpet. Personally, Loki did not get the allure of the carpet. It was simply an ordinary red rag that people stepped on. Just as Loki was about to announce his presence to Stark and antagonise the man, a very familiar face walked right into his line of sight. Grandmaster? Loki blurted out. The man in question's face, facial expression changed to that of a deer caught in headlights to an utterly confused soul in the span of about five seconds. I believe you have me mistaken for someone else, dear. My name is Jeff Goldblum. I'm a famous actor, he said quickly. While the man was adept at lying and would likely have fooled anyone else, being the god of mischief, Loki could sense even the slightest bit of deceit from light years away. Look, I don't know w if you're parading around Midgard as some kind of celebrity. In fact, it would not surprise me at all. But you are also a Grand Master of Sakaar, Loki stated confidently. You are source labour to those who then kidnap you beings you believe will do well in a fighting ring, and use the trafficked beings as near pawns in your game. The Grand Master's eyes widened as he glanced around the room. How do you know that? he whispered. I spent a bit of time on your planet of garbage a few years back. The accommodations weren't exactly up to my usual standard, but I was desperate at this time because my murderous sister was in destroying my home realm. Loki answered honestly. No, there's no way you have ever been to Sakaar, the Grand Master denied adamantly. I would have remembered someone with a face and a body like yours. I would have remembered someone with a face and a body like yours, he added seductively, placing both hands on Loki's cheeks. Shit, initiating conversation with Grand Master had been a mistake. The guy was a sociopath who literally ran a trafficking ring that resulted in the death of thousands. Sure, Loki had fooled around with the man in the past, but that was before he reformed himself as a hero. And besides, on Sakaar, there had not been any better options, and Loki needed to win the Grandmaster's favour, so he himself would not end up in the fighting ring. No, getting involved with the chaps would be immoral and unbecoming for a superhero. 
Oh, a little fun never hurt anyone. Not like I'm going to wed this lad. Take me upstairs and I can jog your memory. Loki whispered back as he wrapped his arm around the Grand Master's shoulders and the two of them flounced up the stairs together, leaving the party behind. Line break. Okay, this is basically Peter being high. Okay. So, basically I am going to whiz past because, um... Yeah, I'm just going to skip. I'm going to skip, skip, skip. Anyway, sorry guys, but I do not condone drug use at all. Peter was unaware. That does not make it right what happened, but it wasn't his fault. He had no idea and he was hungry. I feel sorry for the kid though, poor Tony. As well. Oh god, May's going to kill him. Anyway, 2013. Loki sat at a large golden table across from his mother, a cup of tea in his hand. He couldn't help but the grin that spread across his face as he and his mother sat in companionable silence as his eyes described the opulence that was Asgard. While he had once believed the golden arches and sumptuous decorations to be pretentious, even if first and being like himself, he now adored every inch of the realm he had grown up in. Thor had originally planned to travel back to Asgard with Loki, but instead opting to rejoin Jane, who was still in London, on their scientific travel adventure. Are you okay, my son? Frigga asked, breaking the silence. I am better than okay. Why do you ask? Loki wondered. There has been a change in you. Ever since Thor's coronation day, it is as though you have experienced a life far beyond your years almost overnight. I can see the heaviness in your eyes. It's the look of someone who has lost everything they once held dear. And yes, there is a nephew glance in your aura, a luminescence only present in those who have had their greatest wish granted to them. Frigga answered as she benevolently rubbed his hand. Loki just blinked at his mother not quite knowing how to respond to someone who somehow managed to practically uncover his secret based on a sporadic observation alone. Loki had been so preoccupied with ensuring the future of the universe since he had been back in time. He hadn't spent nearly as much time with Frigga as he desired. Yet in their limited time together, his mother saw straight through him, despite Loki's best efforts to act like his old self. I honestly have no idea what you are on about, mother, Loki denied. Oh, my son. I think you do, Frigga said softly, cupping Loki's cheek with her hand. But I understand you are not yet ready to disclose what has happened to you. Just know that I will be here for you when the time comes and you wish to share. I love you, my son. While his past self would have squirmed at even the slightest mention of affection, he now didn't hesitate to reply with, I love you, mother. Ma father! Mother! Loki! Thor roared as the volume of his voice practically caused the entirety of Asgard to vibrate. An extremely pale Jane Foster stood beside him, shaking like a leaf. What the hell was Jane doing on Asgard? Loki knew for a fact that Thor was af too afraid of his father's disapproval of him dating a mortal, and would therefore not bring Jane there for at least an impromptu visit. Unless... No. Please tell me this isn't happening. It can't be. We should at least have already had a month. Why is this happening so much earlier than the last time? What is it, my son? Odin inquired as he stormed into the vicinity. Upon laying his eyes upon Jane, a disapproving frown appeared on his face. Why have you brought a mortal to our home? She is very ill, Thor answered. She is a mere mortal. Illness is their defining trait. I brought her here so we could help her. There is something within her that is very powerful, and it is not of us. If we do not provide treatment, she will die, Thor pleaded. Mortals live only about a century old, if they are lucky. A mere blink of an eye to us, Odin countered. So you are saying that just because she is not like us, that our life does not matter? Thor spat out as he narrowed his eyes. Mortals do not belong on Asgard, any more than a goat belongs at a banquet table. Odin said cruelly, How dare you? Oh, Thor bellowed. I am merely stating facts, my son. It is my duty as king to make sure our Asgardian people are performing their duties. And tending to a mortal woman like this one is not... Even with the vitriolic attacks against the... Mo Enough with the vitriolic attacks on the mortal woman, father. This is beyond your bigotry against humans. The ether could kill the love of your son's life. Have some compassion! Loki scolded. 
for the love of the nine realms. Am I seriously being a rational and compassionate one right now? I am suppose when my emotional intelligence is tested against Odin's, there really isn't much contest there. The ether? Odin asked, clearly shocked. Yes, one of the infinity stones is within Jane. Loki confirmed. That's impossible. Odin took a few strides towards Jane and placed his hand near her right arm. The unmistakable red tint of the reality stone rose into the air as Odin felt its power. We must immediately lock down the palace, place the strongest protection spells along the borders of Asgard, and ready our warriors. If the ether has been released, that means Malekith and the rest of the Dark Elves are coming. We must immediately lock down the palace, place the strongest protection spells along the borders of Asgard, and ready our warriors. If the ether has been released, that means the Malekith and the rest of the Dark Elves are coming, Loki instructed. Odin furrowed his eyebrows, glancing at Loki suspiciously. How do you know so much about... It doesn't matter how I know, father. What matters is that our home is in danger, and we need to protect our people at all costs. Loki interjected. Odin, dear, listen to our son. Frigga urged her husband. Very well, Odin agreed reluctantly. Let's gather our defences. End of chapter. Hi, guys. Hope you enjoyed that, because I did. Oh, boy. Well, at least we got Kate Bishop. Forgot she was in this. <laughs> and, ooh, drug abuse. Like, not intentional, but poor Pete. Yeesh. I do not condone any of that. Never do that, guys, if you can avoid it. And, oof, drama in Asgard. I like that Loki is spending time with his mother, though. That's really lovely. Frigga, we didn't get enough of her. So anyway, you guys know the drill. Remember to like, comment, and subscribe. Hit the bell to get notified. And remember to have a good day, night, or whatever time zone you're in. Bye, my guys, gals, and non-binary pals. Stay safe and keep each other together, okay? Bye.